C-SPAN's local content vehicles are traveling the country, visiting cities and towns as we look at our nation's history. This weekend on American History TV, we take you to Richmond, Virginia, and the home of John Marshall, the fourth Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. John Marshall, what can you say? What can you not say? This is a fellow born on the frontier of Virginia who's going to develop into the best lawyer in Richmond. He's going to come to the attention of President John Adams and be sent of all places to France to keep us out of war with France. When he comes back, uh, he's meant for bigger things. He's elected to Congress, but Adams knows a good thing when he sees it, and he nominates him to be his Secretary of State, and he'll actually write Adams' last State of the Union address. And in 1801, Adams is faced with a dilemma. Who shall he appoint as Chief Justice? He turns to Marshall and says, I believe I must nominate you. So at the age of 45, John Marshall will become the fourth Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He's going to serve for 34 years, and he's going to do three important things. He's going to establish the Supreme Court as a true third branch of government. He's going to make the Constitution the chief law of our land, and he's going to create an independent judiciary. Those things formed our national identity and energized our government. He'll serve under five presidents, and he will administer the presidential oath of office nine times. Not bad for a Baxwood boy. This house tells an important story about the development of Richmond. When the capital moves in 1780, government officials also move to Richmond, and they come to this high place called Shackle Hill to build their homes. So many lawyers will live here that it will come to be called Court End. Marshall's house is the first house of any real importance built in this area. It's the oldest brick house in Richmond, and we're so lucky to have it. He lived here from 1790 until he died in 1835, and the neat thing is, it never passed out of the family's hands. They rented it, they rented it, and would you believe in 1910, two of his granddaughters were living in the house. They sold it to the city. The city wanted to tear it down. The Preservation Society said, we'll manage it, and that's how it was saved. And the wonderful thing is, and a great testament to Marshall is, that this house has been open to the public for almost 100 years. Nothing would have given him greater pleasure. By far, the most significant occurrence in relation to John Marshall's life were his lawyers' dinners that were held in this very room. As many as 32 men would have been invited to dine with Marshall on a Sunday afternoon uh, when he was in town, one Sunday a month. And they would actually put the table diagonally across the room so that all of the men could be seated. Uh, it was the one invitation uh, most men coveted in Richmond. Not many people know that John Marshall was the first biographer of Washington. And how does he know Washington? John Marshall's father and George Washington fought together in the French and Indian War. They became surveyors together, and, Marshall, and George Washington will be his lifelong friend and mentor. And in its kind of touching that during Marshall's lifetime, next to George Washington, John Marshall was the most revered man of his day. We can tell that we're in private quarters now. The ceilings are not as high, the furniture isn't as fancy. Uh, Mrs. Marshall has 11 pregnancies. Six of the children survived to adulthood. It's one girl and five boys. The girl was named Mary, and we believe this was her room. We're very fortunate to have an original pastel of Mrs. Marshall. So this is Mary <coughs> Willis Ambler, nicknamed Polly. Now, when Marshall is about 75, he has 1,000 bladder stones removed. I'm not kidding, 1,000 bladder stones removed without anesthesia in Philadelphia. But he bounces back. And um, when he's almost 80, he's returning from the cemetery where Polly was buried, and he collapsed. His son took him back to Philadelphia, and they weren't able to help him. And John Marshall dies in Philadelphia. 
and uh, they performed an autopsy and found lesions of the liver, which means cancer. The nation went into deep mourning. Next to George Washington, Marshall was the most revered man of his day. When they said his name, they spoke it in the same breath as James Madison. Madison as the father of the Constitution, but John Marshall as the definer of it. The justices accompanying his, accompanied his body back to Richmond, and he's buried next to Polly in Shaco Cemetery. John Adams wrote, the proudest act of my life was the gift of John Marshall to the people of the United States. And George Will wrote, he was the most consequential American never to be president. And my favorite anecdote about him is, he fell off the ladder in the Supreme Court library. When they came to help him, he looked up and said, I'm floored. The time in which Marshall lived was a time for the making of great statesmen. We still revere them today, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, but hardly anyone ever talks about John Marshall. Visitors, visitors usually know that uh, he had something to do with the court. Uh, first Chief Justice, I think, is what they usually say. But we hope that by the time they leave, they'll understand his importance to the forming of our national identity to the importance of making America a country of laws and the way in which he did that while at the same time remaining a wholesome personality. C-SPAN's local content vehicles are traveling the country, visiting cities and towns as we look at our nation's history. For more information, go to cspan.org slash lcv.